Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. I know there's one person awake here uh, tonight. Um, we're, we're, we're here with, thank you, uh, we're here with the, the Civic Council tonight, and, uh, and, and, and this is a, an important moment, I think, in, in our history, uh, and, and the numbers that you're going to hear discussed, uh, the Casey Rising uh, metrics, um, are, I think, uh, uh, the most important numbers out there. I think this is, is something that the Civic Council has been working on for a few years about the, the health of Kansas City, essentially, the economic uh, and civic health. Uh, of Kansas City, and their metrics uh, that that compare us to 30 peer cities, uh, and and we're not doing all that well, uh, which I think is uh, uh, John and Sherry will will discuss this and they'll go into detail about it. I, having looked at these over the last few months, they're very similar to uh, and I think related to uh, the the Metro Monitor uh, reports uh, that uh, the Brookings Institution does. Uh, of the 100 largest cities, the most recent of which showed that Kansas City's economic growth uh, was 76th of the 100 largest cities, St. Louis was 69th. Um, these are not great numbers. They're not terrible. They're, you know, we're not falling apart or anything, but they're, they, they, we, need, we need to be more focused and more intentional about what we do. Our GDP, our quality job uh, growth, um, uh, our entrepreneurship numbers in the city uh, home to a lot of uh, uh, entrepreneurs over the uh, the last 150 years and, and to the Kauffman Foundation we ought uh, to to uh, to be doing better uh, on those median household income uh, productivity numbers uh, across the board um, net migration of uh, uh, hi highly educated folks and young and young folks not doing as well as we ought to do um, as you probably know from things that I've said over the years, uh, I attribute some of this to our focus, focus of our economic development uh, policy in Kansas City and in the metro area uh, on subsidizing corporate and developer real estate. Um, we ought to look at tax incentives as uh, a result of, of these numbers. Um, I, some of you might have seen a couple of front page stories in, in the Star where in dialogue with the city finance director, who's now retired, Randy Landis. Um, uh, I uh, got the city to admit to the numbers, the real incentive numbers, which are close to $200 million a year, uh, which would make it the largest uh, part of the city budget uh, other than uh, the police department. Uh, and, and if you compare that to the actual economic development effects, uh, it doesn't look all uh, all that great. And we're also, what are not in the numbers, we're a high tax city. We're one of the highest tax cities in the United States. If you add on to it our sewer and, rates, sewer and water rates, which are among the highest in the United States, we vie with Atlanta and some cities in California for that, uh, for that uh, moniker. Um, we ha have, as I'm sure everybody does know, you probably don't know the sewer and water numbers and you may not know the tax numbers, but you probably know the high crime numbers uh, that we've got. Um, there are things that we need to be working on in this city, and we're not always focused on them. The library is trying to work with the Civic Council, with Mark, uh, with a, a variety of uh, organizations uh, on, on highlighting what we can do, what the issues are, what the numbers really tell us. Uh, and you know we've done that on tax incentives, and we'll continue to do it. There is a tax incentive committee uh, of the Chamber of Commerce that the library and the school district are a part of, thank, thanks to the chamber. Um, we're going to focus on neighborhood and small-scale development. Um, we have another Strong Towns uh, 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 event uh, this month. Please look for it in the calendar, which is about how we can do small-scale development. We've helped talk about uh, affordable housing, eviction, and some of the other uh, problems that have been addressed in the, uh, in the mayoral election. We will continue to address those. But tonight, you get to hear uh, about these numbers from uh, the Civic Council, which is taking a bold step in, in, in presenting uh, these uh, numbers in public, and we are very grateful to them. Uh, uh, John Murphy uh, will, will be up here uh, uh, second. Uh, John has served as chair of Shook, Hardy, and Bacon, uh, I think still our largest law firm for 15 years. Um, uh, he has uh, uh, won uh, the award of the Association of Corporate Council's Value Champion. 
Um, he's been one of the leading product liability litigators uh, in the United States, uh, working uh, for companies that uh, you've heard of, like Ford Motor Company and ConocoPhillips, uh, uh, et cetera. He's also given back to the community in a lot of ways. He's, for instance, recently been the, uh, the chair uh, uh, of uh, the uh, Starlight Theater. Um, uh, first up, though, uh, is uh, Sherry uh, Gonzalez Warren, and we've worked here at the library with uh, Sherry over the years at Mark, uh, and she's recently uh, come to uh, the Civic Council as the Vice President and Director of Casey Rising. Um, she served uh, uh, at Mark uh, as the Community and Economic uh, and Workforce Development Director uh, and uh, uh, has has been a key element in the development of the uh, uh, the metrics and the, and the response uh, to uh, uh, to these metrics uh, at the Civic Council. So I turn it over now first to Sherry Warren. Thank you, good evening. Thank you, Crosby and Carrie and the library for having us tonight. And so what we're doing right now is a community-engaged process for Casey Rising. Just like a show of hands, how many people have heard of Casey Rising before? Excellent, about half the room, so that means we're starting to get some kind of market penetration. Um, if you haven't, that's okay. And even those who have heard of Casey Rising before, we've been in a process of really revamping what Casey Rising is and what we hope to do in the future. And so you're gonna hear some of that tonight. So even if you think that you're familiar with us, there's some new information that we wanna share with you. And so some of what we have been doing is a shared vision process where we really want to articulate what it is that will help to make Kansas City prosperous in the future. And you'll hear a little bit about that process, but we want to engage you in that process right now. So I am going to ask you to do something that you usually do not do in a meeting. Pull out your cell phone, please. Okay, if you have your cell phone out, you can either go to pullev.com slash slevy198, or you can text slevy198 to the number 22333. And you can select these answers are not things we just made up. We actually, as part of the community engaged process, had conducted a survey and more than 300 individuals responded in August and they told us that yes, we do believe Kansas City will be prosperous in the year 2030, but what is holding us back are potentially these things. And so we want to ask you, of these issues that were identified, what do you think is holding Kansas City back? We have education, things like workforce readiness, experiential learning, lifelong learning, and building that regional talent pipeline, housing and affordability, safe neighborhoods, district thinking, transportation, economic opportunity, economic stewardship, which is really about having an ecosystem that helps us to build firms and businesses in Kansas City. Economic strength, where we pick some of those sectors that we really have excellence in, or maybe where we can have a first mover's advantage. And then character and culture, arts, entertainment, food, sports, all of those things Kansas Cityans have told us are both important to a prosperous future and things that we could address and strengthen in our community. So you can see, at least in this group, what the responses are. So far, 24% said housing, affordability, and safe neighborhoods. 20% said education. I'll give another couple seconds for answers. We can let you know in a second, and you can actually tell us as well. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the next question. 23% said education, 19 housing and affordability, 19% economic opportunity, and we see economic stewardship is moving up. Metro, so, okay. 
So everything that Casey Rising is talking about, good question, is the 14 county metropolitan statistical area. That is sort of the area that we serve. And so why do you think that that issue, whatever it is that you selected, is holding Kansas City back? And you can type in whatever it is that you want to in this section. So why? Lack of high-tech job development, somebody has said. Disparity in educational opportunities. Lack of overall unified strategy and in industrial policy. <laughs> High taxes, systemic problems no city is immune to. Wealth is concentrated in 2%. The competition, high crime rate. And so as you continue to sort of give us those answers, we do want you to know that we're collecting this information. And as we do these community events here and in other places, uh, this is information that is going to feed back into the priorities that the steering committee selects. The long racist history. Okay. Another couple seconds and then I'm going to move on. No research university. Unequal wages. Okay. So how Casey Rising began, why we even came to be, is that there was a report that was done by Mid-America Regional Council, my former employer, and also Brookings Institute. This was released in 2014. You can still access it on the MARC website. And it was called Prosperity at a Crossroads. And what was found in this report is that in Kansas City, we actually, in the 90s and 2000s, and even into the Great Recession, were doing really well on almost every economic indicator. And in comparison to our peers, we had continued to do well. We didn't fill the recession as quickly as some of our peers, but once we started to fill the recession in Kansas City, we were not coming out as quickly as some of our peers. And so that pace issue, as some of our early co-chairs had said, the check engine light came on. We weren't in a crisis situation, but we certainly were in a situation that we wanted to diagnose and do something about with some intentional action. And so that is the origins of Casey Rising. The business community got together and said, what if we really looked at the Kansas City regional economy, the metro area, and we approached it as we would a business. And we said, let's do these types of things to help grow the economy and grow it for everyone. And so that was the origins of Casey Rising. And we have continued to evolve. Um, we officially launched in 2015 and continued to evolve since. I don't know if it was mentioned in the, um, in my intro, but the position that I now fill was a new position that was just created, and I've only been in the role since January, and so um, some of this work, it's part of why it's new. So we want to have you hear a little bit about Kansas City and KC Rising from people other than just us. Um, KCPT had put this together earlier this year. Kansas City, our metro. Our community, our source of home, town, pride. A lot of it. We love this place, but why? Is our city really the best city? Is the KC Metro better than every other metro? What would that even mean? How do we compare one city to another and why should we even try?
In Kansas City, in the 90s, our economy did pretty well. In the 2000s, we didn't feel the recession as quickly as other places, but once we felt it here, we didn't come out as quickly. And the business community then said, what if we came together and we looked at Kansas City like a business? We got together and we figured out how to grow the regional economy. And so that's been an initiative called Casey Rising. Having a peer frame is important, whether you're a baseball team, a football team, a soccer team, because it tells you how you're doing. And that's important because it allows you to attract and retain talent, and it allows you to attract and retain new business. It allows you to attract and retain capital. And so we're looking at peer cities and that work, and the peer cities are determined by population size. So the 15 larger, 15 smaller. And the KC Metro right in the middle. These are our peers, metros of a similar size that give us a way to answer, are we better than other metros? At what? All cities, all regions have something that they're really, really good at. And so it's important to start with what are you really, really good at and build on that as a strength. We have several major sectors that make a difference for our economy. Those are the life sciences, finance and insurance, information technology, advanced manufacturing, and architecture and engineering. The data shows that these five sectors of the KC economy are major drivers of our metro's GDP, or how much money our region makes as a whole. And GDP is just one of the data sets that these groups are tracking. There's data on the number of quality jobs and medium household income, data for degrees and hiring, data for value of exports, and even data on the growth rate of the value of exports. There's a lot of data. Data affirms what we know and challenges us in assumptions, sometimes proving us wrong, sometimes saying maybe we're not as good at something as we think we are. In terms of how Kansas City is doing relative to pure cities, I've observed some data recently from the chamber that suggests, you know, we're not retaining um, people as, as we should. We're, we're, we have a net loss. In fact, we're ranked 30th out of 31. That's bad. The data also shows that we aren't graduating enough bachelor degrees in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM degrees. These aren't just bad rankings. These two data points together are bad from a workforce development perspective. Those five major sectors of our local economy, those are all STEM jobs. Many local companies already have openings for good paying jobs that they can't find qualified people for. And studies show that over the next 10 years, that's only going to rise. And that makes it difficult to attract new businesses. You're more attractive if you have a workforce that can meet the needs of the company, right? It's not about the buildings. It's not about anything in process or anything else. It's about the people. Developing our own talent in Kansas City from early childhood programs all the way through higher education is extremely important. At one point, if you didn't have a skill set in your region that you needed, you simply went outside your, your four walls of, of your community and said, well, we'll go find it somewhere else and bring it here. Now the workforce, you know, it just doesn't exist. You know, you, either, you can't go say, well, I'll go buy, I'll go buy my uh, engineers from Nashville because they don't have enough engineers. I'll go buy my IT people from Austin because they don't have enough IT people. It's about the people. In Kansas City, our metro is making it happen. School districts throughout the metro have created incredible career and technical education programs. Organizations like Casey Degrees are reconnecting young adults to programs that can qualify them for good paying jobs and businesses are focusing less on traditional four-year degrees and more on stacking credentials. Educators, organizations, and businesses throughout the Metro are working together to build people pathways to good paying jobs and companies pathways to good people. I mean, if we're successful at this, we will see household income across the board increase. We will also see the companies in this community continue to be able to grow without having to plant a base in somewhere like Austin or Boston, that they could find the talent here and stay here and keep those jobs here. And, and frankly, if we do a good job of this, this would be one of those hotbed places where people come, where young people in particular go, I'm gonna go there, I know I won't have any problem finding work. We wanna be that place.
American Graduate Getting to Work is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Good evening, everyone. As Crosby said, I'm John Murphy. I'm one of the co-chairs of Casey Rising. I'm going to talk about some of the metrics that were just in that video in a second. I'd point out that that video was uh, about a year outdated, so there's some changes in the metrics. I will say, though, that based on current polling, Kansas Cityans are optimistic about what this region is going to look like in 2030. And that's one of the things that we're working on right now to see what a shared vision of regional prosperity might look like. And as we articulate our vision, I just wanted to talk about our purpose. And that's to achieve a shared vision of regional prosperity for all. And the word all there is very important because we're talking about inclusive prosperity here. When you see some of our peer cities, San Jose, for example, on some of our economic metrics, if you look at Silicon Valley and the San Jose region, some of their metrics on their face blow us out of the water. But there's nothing about inclusive prosperity when you look at San Jose. You have the haves and the haves nots. And that's not what we're looking to develop as we work toward 2030. And the purpose of KC Rising is not to basically take initiatives and run with them, but rather to identify gaps in our regional economic structure and then figure out what's the best way to convene the influencers and align them on a common purpose. For example, I know in the, in the questioning that Sherry just had, we talked a little bit about transportation and somebody mentioned access to jobs and mobility. We know in this region, based on people that we've talked to, that we have individuals in this part of the region that need jobs. And we have individual companies in this part of the region that need workers. We've got to figure out a better way to get the people that need jobs to the places that need workers and have access and mobility through a mass transportation system. Another example, when we talk about education, there are a number of school districts including North Kansas City, Independence, Blue Valley, Olathe, that have excellent programs with respect to STEM training. That they're working very hard with individuals that are interested in the science, technology, engineering, and math. We need, again, to do a better job of coordinating those efforts, and we're working toward that. So what we're looking for is inclusive prosperity and community efforts that make the greatest impact. And basically, we have a 14-county metropolitan statistical area, so that's what we're looking at. There was a question asked earlier, are we looking at Kansas City, Missouri? And obviously, we're not. We're looking at a much broader 14-county uh, area when we're talking about the region. And we've developed what we call the stewards of the public square which are basically representatives of business, education, government, and human surface services. And when you see the composition of our steering committee, I think you'll start to get a sense of that's what we're working toward. And basically, the, the framework when it first started for Casey Rising is we were looking at three economic drivers. We were looking at trade, ideas, and people. And with respect to trade, we had a lot of work before we kicked off KC Rising back in the 2014-2015 time frame to identify those industries in the Kansas City region that could have an impact well beyond our region. We identified two to start off with. One was what we call global design, which is the confluence of our architectural, engineering, and construction firms. Some of you may have seen commercials before the AFC Championship game last year when we had every hope of getting to the Super Bowl. But one of the things we noted in those commercials was Kansas City's been in every Super Bowl for years because the architects and engineers in this city have designed the stadiums where the Super Bowls were played. Over 50% of the water treatment plants in the, in the world have been designed and engineered and architect by firms in the Kansas City area. The second one we, just, we concentrated on was what is now called BioNexus KC, which is the convergence of our animal and human life sciences programs, basically coming from Manhattan to Columbia. And people told us when we, we did interviews, not just in the region, 
but around the country that we could make a global impact in those two areas. One of the things we're looking at as we move forward is what's number three as we look forward to a traded sector? Is it cyber data and some of the things we're doing at places like Garmin and Sprint and Cerner? Or it might be something else, but it's something we're looking at for number three. And then ideas are basically the relationship between larger and smaller companies and building a dynamic ecosystem. And then people. And that's basically having a diverse, skilled talent base where we can attract talent, develop it, and retain it. But more recently, we're also concentrating on what we're talking about in terms of regional enablers. Place, policy, and exclusion. There was a recent study done of millennials around the country and how they pick the cities they're going to choose. And what was found in that study that I think most people went into the study thinking that a vibrant urban lifestyle was going to be something very attractive. There were three things. Commute, affordable housing, and green space. Those are the three things that people coming out of college are looking to when they pick a site where they want to live. This is basic, the, the steering committee, there's one change on here. Um, an individual that I don't think it's public yet is going to be leaving because of job responsibilities. But this is trying to mirror the public square uh, diagram that I showed you earlier. And it's, we're trying to ac accomplish gender diversity, ethnicity diversity, and generational diversity in, in terms of our steering committee. These are our metro uh, competitors. Seattle is the largest on the list, all the way down to Richmond. So we picked the 15 largest and the 15 smallest. And what we were doing is we picked peer cities because we wanted basically to evaluate our economic progress in two ways. Obviously, we wanted to see how Kansas City was growing as a region in terms of gross domestic product, quality jobs, and median household income. But we also wanted to look at how we were doing versus our peers. So maybe our median, our median household income grew by 6% in a four-year period. And you could say, well, that's pretty good growth. But if our peers were at an average of 9%, then we could say, well, we're doing good, but not good enough. And I had mentioned that the, that video we showed was a little bit outdated. Let me give you an example. And I think it shows why some of this data, you have to look at the long range. I'm from New Jersey, so I'm not always the most patient individual in the world. But I think when you look at this, you have to exercise some patience because a lot of these are long-term goals. For example, in the video, it mentioned on the median household income that we were 12th. Well, in the latest, we're, we're 16th. Providence, Virginia, Beach, Nashville, and Columbus all passed us. But if you look at those numbers, there's about 10 or 12 cities that are separated only by a few thousand dollars. Another example that's not on this chart, and Crosby mentioned it in, his, in opening remarks, we have an annual review of our metrics. And in 2017, we talked about the net migration of individuals with bachelor degrees out of this region and we were 30th out of 31. And when we saw that number, and we started to peel away the onion, and a couple of things became obvious. Somebody gets a bachelor's degree at UMKC, and then goes away to get a master's degree at University of Wisconsin, or St. Louis University. That individual is shown as having a bachelor's degree and leaving our region. The other thing, obviously, that we face when you start to look behind these numbers is an individual who retires with a bachelor degree and moves to Phoenix or Florida to a warmer client. We, we lose that individual. But a lot of times when you're looking at these metrics, the numbers are so small that year by year you're seeing a significant difference. For example, we are now 21st and not 30th with net migration. Is that good enough? No, it's not but it is an improvement. You can see, for example, under quality jobs. And quality jobs are defined in two ways. Number one, 
It means a job where you need an advanced degree beyond high school or where the job pays better than the national average, which right now is at about $47,900. So it obviously can be a trade where a college degree is not needed, but because of the expertise involved in that trade, it pays better than the national average. And then obviously GDP, where we continue to, la to lag, we're 20th. And again, we call these horizon goals because they're goals that we're looking at 10, 15, 20 years from now. Because you're not going to change GDP over the course of a year or two years or three years. Some of the early accomplishments, I think first and foremost is the fact that we have people talking. Doug Gerard, who's the current chancellor of KU and who was one of the first co-chairs of KC Rising, mentioned in a meeting we had about a month ago that the greatest thing about KC Rising is, is we have people talking that have never talked before. We have four sponsoring organizations, the Civic Council, the Kansas City Area Development Council, the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce, and the Mid-America Regional Council. Each one of them brings a particular expertise to the table. The chamber obviously specializes with respect to small and medium-sized businesses. The Civic Council is basically fronting the expense money that's needed to run this organization. We have, for example, Sherry, who's an employee of the Civic Council, but also the director of Casey Rising. The Mid-America Regional Council helps us with respect to a lot of policy and legislative items that we're looking at. And then the KCADC helps us with talent, marketing, and branding. I mentioned the Global Design and BioNexus KC under trade. KC Rise Fund and KC Invest Ed, that's really interesting in terms of our ideas. The KC Rise Fund is something that's called a side saddle fund. And basically, Darcy Howe, who runs that, went out and raised approximately $20 million with respect to KC Rise number one. And then she worked with investors around the country to work with that $20 million to help entrepreneurs. Because one thing we want to do is we not only want to help entrepreneurs get a start in Kansas City, but once they get going or successful, we want to keep them here. Because down the road, they're going to be life, the lifeblood of this economy. KC Invested, which is an arm of KC Rising, is an effort to put entrepreneurs together with the business community. There's lunches, there's dinners. I've met a lot of young entrepreneurs who have tremendous ideas. But if you ask them to put a business plan together, you get a deer in the headlights look because they don't have that experience. So we have retired CFOs from companies like DST and KPMG working with these individuals who have a plan, who have an idea, to put together a business plan so they can go to potential investors and raise the money they need to get started and develop a thriving business. And then under people, KC degrees. We have 300,000 people in the metropolitan area that have some college education but do not have a college degree. KC degrees is working with those individuals and getting them reconnected to the college experience. KC Scholars. KC Scholars is basically giving people an opportunity who might otherwise not be able to afford to go to college to be able to raise the money to allow them to do that. The Talent to Industry Exchange is basically we take a specific industry and then we work with those business leaders to ask them, what types of talent do you need? because we want to get those answers because then we can go to the education side of the region and say, you got to change your curricula because this is the experience we need to get people jobs, to get the talent we need into the companies. You've got to start teaching that talent. So those are some of the early successes with respect to what we're trying to accomplish. Before we get to this poll, one thing I do want to talk about for a second is what we are calling a shared prosperity forum that's taking place on October 2nd and October 3rd. We are getting together 
leaders in this region, primarily diverse leaders, that frankly I don't think have ever gotten together before. And we're going to have a two-day summit with national and local speakers. And we're going to be talking about things like education. We're going to be talking about things about economic incentives, about affordable housing, about equitable wages. And yeah, we'll talk about crime because you cannot talk about this region without talking about crime. But one of the things we've talked about at length is I understand that the legislative bodies here need to look at things like buyback programs and stronger background checks, but we are going beyond that. We have to build up our neighborhoods. We have to give every person in every neighborhood access to jobs. We have to give every person in every neighborhood a wage that allows them to live. And I'm not talking about minimum wages here. I, I wrote an op-ed to the Kansas City Star several months ago where we talked about minimum wage. And when you look at what minim the minimum wage is and what it takes for a family of four to survive, we've got to make that a more progressive wage. Affordable housing obviously has to be there. And when you start to take care of some of those things, hopefully you start to take care of some of the crime issues that we are facing. And they are real. When the USDA, when we met with them in Washington, D.C., and we talked to the USDA employees there about coming to Kansas City, one of the first issues they raised, there was actually two, one was mass transit, and their concerns about the lack of mass transit, and the other one was crime. And I don't want to knock D.C. I really don't. But when you have people in D, <laughs> but when you have people in D.C. talking about their concerns about crime in Kansas City, that's something we have to worry about and something we have to address. Not later, but now. Sherry, I'm technologically challenged, so I have no idea how to do this poll. So, doing it. Oh, there we go. Okay. So Are you already doing it? Yeah, go. No, this isn't existing data. We cleared it. So you guys are, this is new data. A few people started before he said go ahead. So, so these that are mentioned here, these, again, aren't things we just came up with on our own. There's active work in each one of these areas around economic inclusion in Kansas City. They are the work groups that SP2 is going to focus on, and so we also want to hear from you. Some advice that we had received that we considered to be sage advice was that we also need to figure out where the community's sort of temperature and readiness is to deal with these things, because none of this is going to be easy right? It does take effort. And so it will take all of us to make progress. So we want to hear from you about what you think um, is important. So this one's structured a little different. You actually do higher to highest to lowest. So you drag to the top what you think is most important and you drag to the bottom uh, what you think is you know, least important in terms of contributing to economic mobility. While you're doing that, I'm going to conduct my own, own poll. If you go around the country night right now based on work we've done, what do you think of the three top things associated with this region? Agriculture. Keep going, agriculture? Well, our presentation helps. The highway system, the rail network. Nope. More specific. <laughs> More specific. Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> That's one. Barbecue is two. Well, barbecue is one of the three. Mahomes is the second. And the third is our work ethic. So, you know, we can talk about some of our peer cities, and we can look at, well, they have mountains, and they have the ocean. What no one else can, has that no one can take away from this is we're in the heart of America. And there's a recognition that there is a work ethic here, that there's a friendliness. Um, Dr. Kim Beatty, the chancellor of the Metropolitan Community Colleges, calls it, we're cosmopolitan nice. 
which I think is a great term um, and something that, you know, we use now. A week, is this working? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah it's going up and down. So they're ranking them. It's a little different in the kind of poll that we're asking you to do. It's not a percentage. It's a ranking, and they've gone up and down. You know, as this is up there, one of the things I should mention in terms of economic values and incentives, Casey Rising in and of itself is not an organization in the truest sense of the word. It's not a 501c3. It's not a profit. It's, ba it's not a not-for-profit. It's basically a collaboration of about 300 volunteers, again, from the business sector, the education sector, the legislative sector that are working together. And we decided early on that we were not going to have a policy and advocacy arm. We were going to rely on our sponsoring organizations, particularly Mid-America Regional Council, the Chamber, and the Civic Council to drive policy and advocacy at the state levels and in, in local levels and at times the federal level. So when we talk about some of these things about economic values and incentives, obviously, that's something that our sponsoring organizations are uh, looking into. Okay. While we're doing this, we left time, and hopefully you'll have questions. And, and Sherry and I are up here now, um, so fire away, and please make them tough. Tom has a question. Okay. Oh, they want you to go to oh, the microphone. Oh, the mics. Go to the microphone, please, Tom. Or yell really loud. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm, uh, I was going to bring something up a little bit different, and that is organized labor. Do you feel that a city that has a strong, vibrant organized labor contingent is a plus or a minus for, a, for, a, for a, this city or just in general? Is, that a, is unions good for a city's growth and prosperity or not so good, and why? I think it's good, um, and I think we've been working very closely with that, particularly in the global design area, because a lot of the construction uh, firms that we're working with obviously have a labor orientation, and they have worked with us very closely on the talent to industry exchange to start to identify, again, working with companies as to what jobs are needed in what areas. You know, it, it's an interesting thing, because when we talk about organized labor sometimes, I think we are talking about trades as opposed to college degree jobs. And one of the things that I think is, is very critical here, um, we had a school superintendent from one of the local schools, uh, school districts, and he talked about the fact that we need to change our mindset, that what we have to identify with children is they need a path. And that path doesn't necessarily have to be college. When they're a sophomore or junior in high school, if they don't have a college path, that's okay. But give them a path. And he said it was interesting because he gave his presentation to the PTA, and he talked about the fact that, hey, it's okay if the path is not college, if it's a trade. And everybody in the audience said, that is a great idea, but my kid's going to college. And, you know, I think our generation, my generation, has probably caused a lot of that problem because we've said, hey, you got to go to college to be successful. You don't. You can establish a good trade and have a great job and not have college debt and be very successful. And we've got to start building that up again as we move forward. Questions? All right. Hi, John. Uh, I'm Tom Esselman. I'm the CEO of Connecting for Good, nonprofit. Thank you. I, my question is about, and this is the second time I've seen a public presentation on Casey Rising, and I, I don't understand why um, there are metrics that are comparing Kansas City to other cities in terms of things like GDP and stuff like that. Because you even mentioned it, you know, one of the three top things we're known for is work ethic. And to me, and you know, a lot of years now working, particularly in the urban core, where there's a lot of uh, people struggling day to day, there's nothing like the dignity of work, the dignity of just having a job. And I have yet to see a metric that compares cities and regions in terms of the available jobs that 
there aren't enough people qualified to get those jobs. And I know that's really at the heart of what Casey Rising is all about. But I've yet to see that as a metric comparing us to other cities. Because I'd love to know that we were part of a city that, by and large, all we cared about was making sure we did everything we could to make sure that people who are eligible to get a job could get a job. There's just, I haven't seen a metric like that yet. And I just wanted to know if you guys have come across anything like that that starts to talk about the metric of just available jobs versus people who just aren't yet getting those jobs. It's not unemployment yeah. Yeah. rate, it's something no, different. So There's two parts to your question. I'm gonna let you. Sherry answer the last one because it's a tougher question. <laughs> I knew that's why yeah. you're giving it to me. <laughs> Yeah. So I, uh, I'll actually address both parts of your question. So why does Casey Rising compare ourselves to other cities? That's a good question, right? And part of why we do it, all of you should have received this pamphlet when you walked in. Part of why we do it is because if you look at our horizon goals and those three areas, those are just general just practice of what you do for economic development, right? That we didn't, we didn't create those out of nowhere. Those are just good practice for economic development. The thing we did do is elevate inclusion by choosing median um, household income and quality jobs, not just any job, but the kind of jobs that, that you can build wealth and sustain a family, right? And so if you look at the, the dots, the red dots and the blue line, that's Kansas City. And before Casey Rising, we would look at a number like regional gross domestic product and we would see that Kansas City has actually increased almost 6% since 2014 in regional gross domestic product. And before Casey Rising, we'd be like, wow, that's more than two or 3%. Good job, Kansas City, well done. Because we now compare ourselves to other cities, what we have been able to see, and if you want to go to that, so here we are. What we have been able to see is that we're not keeping pace. 12.5%. That is the burning platform for Casey Rising, is that that pace means our rank drops year to year. And so each one of these look just like that. The numbers change slightly. And that's why we compare ourselves to peer cities, is because it gives us a context of how our growth is in comparison to other cities. We're not in a crisis situation. We're doing pretty well, but we want to be in a place, we don't want to get to the place where we're trying to pull ourselves out of a crisis situation. Your second question about why, why isn't there a metric about available jobs versus sort of people, the challenge with that and you know what I used to do, Tom, right, is, is that the available jobs number is really, really, really messy, right? It, there are certain places like a hospital that advertises a nursing position always and forever and never takes it off. We have no idea how many nurses they actually are trying to hire for, <laughs> right? It's just one nursing position that's sort of advertised. Uh, the same thing happens at a place like Cerner for software developers. They never take it off. It's just this constant search. They might have 10 positions. They might have three positions. They might have 300 positions. It's one listing. And, and the other thing that happens with those is that they fluctuate like this. And so there isn't sort of this like fixed number of available jobs. At any given day, that number does this. And so we've tried our best to use things like quality jobs. Are we growing the number of those for our region? Are we doing it consistently? And then are we making sure that we're able to fill those jobs and create pathways for the people who live here to be able to access that? And so that's part of what we're doing. So that's the answer is the volatility of available jobs. It's really hard to do. And, and following up on Sherry's comments, Tom, we're looking at new metrics as well. I think these metrics are always going to be out there, but as I said, these are horizon metrics. And one of the things, anytime you start looking at economic metrics, you want to make sure that you don't do something for the sake of an economic metric that ruins what you have. For example, some of you may have seen recently that Austin's got an all, a brand new marketing campaign saying, keep Austin weird. And the reason they're doing it is because they've lost what they've had. Yeah, they were in its city. 
And you can think about it as an it city when you're sitting in traffic for two hours now because their infrastructure has not handled what they've had. And so they're trying to get some of that back. Denver has a lot of those same issues. So when you start to look ahead of what you want to look like at 2030 and you start to look at what your vision is, you have to make sure that you're happy with that vision. And I talk about it as a vision. You know, I, I like to say when Martin Luther King spoke at the Lincoln Memorial, he didn't say, I had a plan. He said, I had a dream. And then he plugged in what was going to come in later on. And that's where we are right now. We're articulating that vision, and then the how comes later. Question? Not so much a question. Uh, one of your initial charts at the very right-hand side was, I think, mean household income? Medium. Yeah. Medium, excuse me. This is I, not the one we had, but we can get that up there. Okay. Uh, just from an engineering point of view, it would have more value if you normalized it with cost of living for that area? True. Because San Jose was way, way up at the top. Right. right. Well, that doesn't take into account cost of living. That column basically has very little value. Okay. And then the other thing I guess I'd like to talk about is education, specifically higher education, and consider the fact that over the last three or four decades, the state of Missouri, as well as the state of Kansas, has made a deliberate choice to defund higher education. They provide less than 20% of the cost of higher education now. The same is true as in, in Iowa, the same is true in Nebraska. So in this Midwest region, all of these states have made a decision. We are no longer gonna put a priority on higher education. And that'll lead me to my question then. How does that affect your region? How does that affect your possibilities for growth when it now costs so much to get a degree locally? So those are very good questions. And I think that the one thing we have is that we're in good company. The Midwest region is not unique in that it's defunding higher education, right? It is happening nationally all over the place. What we have been looking at, so we don't have a final solution, but what we've been looking at is what cities, what places, what locations have been able to offset that with civic engagement that looks a little different than just putting it on the backs of the students, right? And so there are a couple of areas where they have stronger partnerships and connections to the private sector. Corporations are getting involved and they're they are doing it because it is a talent pipeline and they are doing it because it is an innovation pipeline, right? And so there are unique private public partnerships that have formed in other places that we don't have in Kansas City yet. And so that's one um, thing we're looking at. It doesn't mean it's what we're going to do or what it will look like, I don't know. So talking about measurements, can you measure, mm -hmm. for example, that are granted in our town? Yes. So he asked a question about, can we measure the number of internships? That is something we've actually been working on just this year and some of the new metrics that we will put out. Now here's what's interesting about that. What we found as we started to do that is that an internship did not equal an internship, did not equal an internship. People called things internships that didn't match what the employers actually considered an internship. There were things titled internships where a student never left a school building, never set sight in a workplace, and never interacted with a professional. There is no one in a business setting that would have considered that an internship, right? And, and so the, we have 15 school districts that we're currently working with where we're looking at, at this new definition of internship, what does that look like? One of the school districts, I will protect the guilty, sort of said, oh, we have at least 100 internships every year. They looked at the new definition, they said zero. We have zero internships. <laughs> and, and so what you will start to see is a standardization of a metric around client projects and internships and apprenticeships, at least from the KC Rising perspective, where we can start to say, here's where we start. And where we're starting is less than 20% of students across the region have a compilation of those things. 
right? And, and if that's our starting base, can we set some goals so where we can have more of that occur because we know how powerful that is for the individual, for the community, for the employers. And so, yes, that's, we're looking at that. On a, as an aside on higher education real quick too, I know when we did the questioning, somebody talked about the lack of a research university in the region. And we looked at that pretty hard. And yes, yeah, sure, Raleigh has Duke, Nashville has Vanderbilt, but if you look at the 30 city, 30 peer cities that are in the program that we gave you or in the brochure, there's a lot of cities in there that do not have a, a research uh, institution, you know, of oh. hot, top notch. No, not when you look at these cities. Wash U, Carnegie Mellon. Oh, sure. Probably half. They've of all them. got great universities. Well, urban universities. not all of not them. Not all of them. Not all of them. Sacramento doesn't, for example. Um, Richmond doesn't, Memphis doesn't, Oklahoma City doesn't, Jacksonville Annapolis. doesn't. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. Yeah. You had a question. Um, uh, my name is Nian Sui, and part of the diversity inclusion of RSM. So I really appreciate uh, prosperity for all the statement you made. So my question is, I'm sure all the peer cities that are looking at the same studies and, and trying to keep up their rank and all that. So I, I moved from LA, and I think that we can, we always think about those common things that we want, affordable housing, transportation, high tech, and all that. What if we do a, a, a different view, a drastic move, like for example, we move the bottom by having like universal basic in income, or in the poll, arts always comes at the end. Maybe we say, we'll double down on art. So uh, have you think about the different strategy uh, compared to other peer? Yeah, a couple things. First, on your first question, one of the things that I think we are doing is approaching this better than some of our peer cities. And I'll give you a, a specific example. The Kresge Foundation and the Brookings Institution are basically underwriting the uh, October 2nd, October 3rd Prosperity Summit that we're having that I discussed earlier. And, for the fir and they've done it in, in other cities as well. For the first time, they are letting us set the agenda because they said for the first time the business community is actively involved in this shared prosperity summit. So they're letting the city do that. In response to your second question, we have talked about that. And I, I think it's a matter for debate. Let's say the income disparity is here and here. And you move the bottom up here and the top goes up here so the gap stays the same. Is that okay? In other words, you still have an income gap, but you've moved both levels up. Or do you need to close the gap? But if you close the gap and the, and the lower level stays here and you close the gap and you don't bring the lower level up, I don't think you've accomplished anything. So those are some of the things we're talking about with respect to the you know, income disparity among levels in the region. The, Sherry? the only other thing I would add to that is that what you've heard so far, so I've mentioned a couple of times, we are in progress, right? We're, we're still articulating a shared vision. We have not yet determined under Casey Rising 2.0 exactly where we're gonna place strategic bets. Strategies have not yet been determined, right? The areas of interest have been determined and so um, we hope to have some innovative ideas. I don't know if there'll be any of the ones you mentioned, right? But, but the, I, the hope is and intent is to find some innovative ideas to move Kansas City forward and accelerate our growth. And, and one thing we haven't talked about, and it's, it's an elephant in the room and it's gotta be discussed, is the history of racism in this region. And y you know, I, I think the state line obviously is there. But you know, you saw Sandy Price, who was one of our former co-chairs, and one of the things Sandy Price likes to say is, is that the reason there's a reason why your windshield is a lot bigger than your rearview mirror, because you got to be looking forward and not in the past. You can't ignore the past, you can't forget the past, but you have to overcome the past by looking forward, and that's one of the things we're addressing. Um, all the leadership of the sponsoring organizations is in the process of attending a uh, series of one and a half day seminars put on by a company called REI, which is Racial Equity Racial Institute Equity based Institute. out of North Carolina. And they're out of North Carolina, and we've been going to that. I went to it about two weeks ago, where we basically talk about the history of racism in the United States 
and the history of racism in the Kansas City region and how we can start to take steps to address that because you can't ignore it. And I'm not suggesting that it be ignored. Question. Okay, la last two questions right okay. here, Jack and you, sir. Uh, thanks, Sherry and John. We really appreciate it. And by the way, I'm not cosmopolitan nice. I'm <laughs> proud of it. <laughs> anyway, if you take a look at these peer group metro areas, yeah. there is no metro area that is as evenly divided on an economic base by a state line mm -hmm. as Kansas City, Kansas City Metro. And that's the real issue here. For instance, you talk about the chiefs, yes, but who's paying for the stadiums and the other amenities that house those regional assets? It's the taxpayers of Kansas City, Missouri. And until we start talking about regional financial responsibility and regional collaboration, then the USDA is going to continue to say, we don't like the crime rate in Kansas City. And by the way, they're not talking about Leewood and Overland Park. They're talking about Kansas City, Missouri. So until you address regional collaboration and regional financial responsibility, frankly, we're wasting our time on a lot of this other stuff. Mm -hmm. the, uh, one of the members of our steering committee is David Van Drow. And he's a columnist, national affairs for the Washington Post. And when we had a small group session, one of the things he talked about was trying to accomplish economic disparity in a region where there is a state line. And obviously, the state line is there. You can't ignore it. But you can work with it. And I think you're starting to see work, for example, with the uh, truce that was just signed by our governors. Um, we had an event two weeks ago where 22 mayors from the region came together. There is a mayor's conference on Missouri side that convenes on a regular basis. There is a mayor's conference on the Kansas side that convenes on a regular basis. They are now going to start to meet together on a regular basis. Because the, the mayor of Parkville and the mayor of Prairie Village have a lot in common in terms of their economic structures, their needs, their desires, their, their wants, and we got to start getting together on that. You know, if we look at mass transit, it's going to have to be on a regional basis. Uh, some of you may have seen the paper just the other day where high school students in Missouri have to have an accounting, economic kind of awareness part, part of their curriculum, but you don't have to have it on Kansas. Well, why not? I mean, how, I'm sorry, I'll get on my soapbox now. How stupid is that, that, you know, somebody on the Missouri side learns how to balance a checkbook and knows what a debit card is, and you walk across the state line and you don't have that same opportunity? That doesn't make any sense to me. And that's one of the things we have to fix. So the only thing I'll add to John's comments is we agree, right? And, and it's part of why alignment is in our purpose. And it is, it is in our DNA in that if we don't figure out how to work together and realize <coughs> that we are actually as a region very interdependent, right? It isn't just sort of collaborate, it's that we're interdependent. Our success depends on the success of one another. And so um, we believe that if we can get over some of this fragmentation, that we actually can accelerate. It is a necessary part of acceleration. And what we've been told by the mayors that we spoke with, what we've been told by civic leaders that we have spoke with that aren't elected officials, is that if Casey Rising can pick a few of those things that everybody agrees on we need to improve, that, that um, having this sort of civic structure bringing people together will be helpful to move those things in ways that we've been talking about for decades, right? But, but there feels like a sense of hope and momentum that hasn't always been here. And, and Jack, I'm not cosmopolitan nice either. Like I said, I'm from New Jersey, but I'm gonna tell a story that I think fits in a lot with this. I've got a son with Down syndrome who's 28 years old now. And about 10 years ago, we took him to visit his, his sister in New York, and he wanted to visit one of his buddies that used to go to, he used to go to Blue Valley North High School with. And we were in a hotel on Upper West Side and he was gonna have to go downtown, probably about 70 blocks away. And so we took him downtown and he had lunch, but his buddy had to go to work, so we were gonna have to pick him up from lunch. And he called us up and he said, let me take a cab back. Well, he's got Down syndrome. My wife and I looked at each other and we said, we can't do this, this is crazy, he's in New York City. And he said, how will you know 
whether or not I can do it if you don't let me try. So we let him take the cab, and he got back okay. And that's always been kind of one of my mantras when we start to talk about some of this stuff. Yeah, the state line is there. And we have economic incentive issues with respect to some of the things that Jack touched on and some of the others. But how will we know whether we can accomplish this vision of shared prosperity if we don't try? And that's what we're going to do. Question. Here, our last question. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try and keep it as a question, but it starts as a statement. I'm a big fan of quantitative analysis and metrics. I would like to parse a question and suggest a way to quantify something very intangible, which I think is going to change where Kansas City ranks with its peer cities, and that's the quality of life. And when you examine the amount of artistic work, uh, fine and performing arts, creative professions, et cetera, being done, the city comes out as not just sparkling, but over the period of time I've lived here, which is quite some time, getting better and better. Now, obviously, that's, that's a little bit hard to quantify, but I think that when you add that to the scale, um, and you know, it's nice, to, it's nice to point with pride as well as you with alarm, and I think both are appropriate at this point in the city's development. And that's a great way to end. There's a lot of good things happening in this city. And I think everyone should be happy about what's, what's happening in the city. Can we do better? Absolutely. But I hope everybody in here agrees that this is a heck of a good place to live. Mm -hmm. so. Thanks so much, uh, Sherry Gonzalez and John Murphy, and they'll be here with questions. They'll be able to answer questions, individual questions afterwards. And Sherry, do you have one last thing you want to say? I just have one last thing to say. So you can follow us on Twitter if you want to continue to hear about the community engaged process and where this ends up going. But also, those questions that we just asked you are available in an online survey. If you want to share that with anyone, please do. And so you can just go to caseyrising.com under about, there's a community engagement tab. And so please have others have input as well. I don't tweet. Sorry. <laughs> I think it gets you in trouble. <laughs> okay, thanks again.